2024 is the year of elections. More than half the world's population will be going to polls this year, including in some of the world's biggest democracies like India, the United States and Indonesia. How do all these elections potentially impact the economic growth of those countries and the world at large. We talk about some of the economic trends playing out this year. We're joined at the India Today studios at the World Economic Forum at Davos by one of the world's sharpest economic commentators, Martin Wolf. It's an absolute pleasure to have you back with us. I'm Thank pleased you. to be with you. Thank you so much. In the year of elections, when so much of policy and governance will be driven by what helps incumbents come back to power. How do you see all these multiple elections impacting global growth? Let's start from there. Well, I'm assuming that incumbents will, so far as they can, try to ensure that their economies are reasonably buoyant. And from a global point of view, the ones that matter are really the US and India. Um, uh, the other countries are not going to be able to do very much. European countries, for example, they have very little fiscal manoeuvre and very little monetary policy manoeuvre. It's going to be decided by the central banks. In the case of the US and India, I would expect policy to try to be supportive. Biden can't do very much, however. Uh, he's not going to pass any big fiscal bills. He's in the hands of the Fed. Uh, and India looks reasonably strong anyway. So I don't expect, in fact, the elections to have any profound effect on growth this year. In subsequent years, they might be significant. Do you want to build on that and explain what kind of outcomes, in your view, can have what kind of impact on uh, growth prospects of those countries. And if I take India as an example, in your reading of the India story, how much of what happens over the next five years depends, according to you, on the verdict that the Indian voters throw up in May? Well, I'm assuming, because everybody tells me so, that the Prime Minister will be re-elected, in which case I assume we will get more of the same, which is reasonably satisfactory, and India will continue to grow reasonably well. Uh, by world standards, very well, by the potential of India, perhaps not so well, but so somewhere between five and seven, and uh, with measurement difficulties, of course, and that it will be steady as it goes. Uh, nothing really profound will change. We know by now quite a lot about Mr. Modi as a policymaker. I can't imagine it suddenly be quite different. In the U.S., however, uh, the election of Donald Trump could be very significant. Uh, the most obvious thing we know is he's likely to go for a protectionist trade policy, quite a significantly protectionist one with high tariffs. That would obviously create problems for traders with the U.S. everywhere. It would cause a lot of uncertainty everywhere. That will affect the rest of the world. And Trump might, be do, might do other really exciting things which are difficult to predict in foreign r relations, which again could have a big effect on the world. So that seems to me the election that is ultimately like, most likely to change the world, the world economy and world politics. From an economic perspective, how do you assess President Biden's presidency and the sense that despite having done reasonably well, he's got higher anti-incumbency just because uh, Americans, as Farid says, are far more pessimistic than they ought to be. Well, it is really quite difficult to understand. In, I mean, if you look at it from outside, uh, the IMF said very notably in October that the United States was the one major economy that was back on its pre-crisis trend. The one. Uh, that's completely astounding. And so you would think that people would say, well, he's done very, very well. And most economists think he has. Now, obviously, the political lens in America is very, very important. They, the Republicans don't see this. They, they have a, a different, different media universe in which they, in which they live. Uh, inflation has been a big shock. Prices are much higher. Prices are about 20% higher than they were three years ago. People notice that. Uh, just because inflation goes down doesn't mean the price hikes don't mean anything. Most people don't even understand the difference. And, the, and of course, getting back to the pre-crisis trend doesn't sound, pre-pandemic, doesn't sound so good because that's what people expect. So <coughs> for all these reasons, it seems that he's not getting a big bang for the buck. If we spend a moment on China, China is withholding more data on unemployment, on growth uh, than it has been in the past. It's always been a bit of a data black hole. 
What's your best sense at the moment on the basis of everything you're reading and seeing on just how badly China is doing at the moment? Well, we don't know a lot, and the GDP figures have always been doubtful, and they've always been massageable. My own sense of it is that China is growing somewhere, leave aside last year, which was a recovery year. You know, they only came out of COVID last year, so it was bound to be relatively good, and I don't think the 5% figure or so is implausible. But m my sense is that the trend growth in China is probably somewhere about 4%. It could be lower than that, and we don't really know. Uh, so um, I think the, ch the really interesting question is the nature of the stimulus programs that China will bring to bear and how they affect the rest of the world. But it's clear that China's growth has slowed very sharply. But they don't seem to be in any tearing hurry uh, to make the policy interventions which could help them come back. Is that because Xi Jinping is being egoistic and wants to convey a sense that, well, things aren't really badly off and therefore even if technocrats have better plans, they're not putting those plans into action? I think he, that's possible, and he may feel very comfortable in his political position. Who's going to really remove him? He can, he can wait, perhaps forever. I mean, th this is not exactly a democracy, since we were talking about this earlier on. Uh, the other thing, I think, which is more reasonable, he may well feel that China got into a mess because of all its past stimulus programs, all that debt, all that real estate building. And he may feel that's not a good way to go. And perhaps the Chinese, he feels, should grin and bear the, the, the pain of structural adjustments. In your reading, when does India get to being a $10 billion economy? There's so much talk about uh, five, billion, 5 trillion and then 10 trillion from here. And is that pace set? Do you think there are certain policy interventions that you would like to see that can speed up the pace of growth? That's roughly the doubling of the size of the economy. Obviously, one has to allow for inflation and the movement of the dollar. This is quite difficult to, to, to work out. Um, I, I would have to work this out in my head, but I suppose if I allow for inflation, assume the rupee is reasonably stable, maybe this can happen in uh, 10 years or so, maybe a bit less, uh, um, but the, um, the growth rate will probably have to rise a bit, um, seven, something like that would be my guess, uh, and uh, I, I don't think India is yet in that fully stable 7% growth. But can they do more? Well, uh, that they, they can always do more. I mean, we all know there are lots of problems, and uh, if things can be improved, the growth can be raised. On Russia, uh, it seems that Vladimir Putin may be the last man standing in this war against Ukraine. President Zelensky is at Davos, but he's now seeming more and more frustrated and anguished by the fact that military aid isn't coming in. How is it, according to you, that Russia has been able to hold out despite all the sanctions that were imposed? I think the sanctions were never likely to be that effective, so this is not really surprising. It's got more support from its friends than expected, but I think the thing that has surprised me is the lack of will in the West. Uh, surprised me and depressed me. Um, from the Western point of view, this was very, very cheap. It cost very little money. Uh, there seems to be a decision, essentially, particularly in the U.S., in important quarters, to let the Ukraine lose. Uh, and that you reflects... Think that you think so? I mean, I'm not saying this is true of the Biden administration. I think it's true of the Republicans in large part, partly because they, don't, they want a catastrophe on Biden's watch, partly because they're really not invested in the previous policies of the United States to make the world a better place from their perception. I think we're seeing a profound transformation in the geopolitical interests of at least half of Americans. Uh, they become isolationist and essentially indifferent to the fate of most of the world. And lastly, on Bitcoin, uh, what's your outlook from here on? Because there was a sense, and I was speaking to Neil Ferguson this morning, he said, I was a skeptic, then I became a believer, then I gave up all hope, and now I, in the way that things are going, seems there is something there. What do you think? Well, I've always been a skeptic. I remain a skeptic, and nothing will change my view. I can imagine that this is but money. This is not money. <laughs> this, is, this is a speculative asset, and good luck to all the people who buy it. But do you buy the cockroach theory? That, you know, it's like a cockroach it just survives, finds a way, and no matter how if, much you try, if, you can't get rid of it. If there's a lot of money around and people like speculating, it's like asking people why gambling works. 
there'll always be people who buy such a thing and the hope that there'll be somebody else who'll buy it from so them still at a higher price. So waving the flag in the skeptic corner? It's not money, except for gangsters. <laughs> I don't see the point of a money that is only usable for gangsters and crooks. Always sharpen your tricks and uh, very, very biting. Thank you very much, Martin.